Okay, good morning everyone. I hope you had an entertaining and informative KubeCon so far. And we certainly hope to continue along those lines with our talk today about better together topological alignment with DRA. Uh, my name is Patrick Oli. I am a principal engineer at Intel working on Kubernetes and cloud native technologies among various maintainer roles in, in Kubernetes. My main activity and main focus has been on dynamic resource allocation for the last three years. And I'm John Bellameric from Google. Um, so I've been involved in open source Kubernetes for many years now. Um, and uh, Patrick and I are two of the co-chairs of the device management working group, which has sort of taken, uh, adopted what Patrick started with DRA and uh, pushing it through to the finish line um, uh, as our third co-chairs here in the front row. So um, go ahead. Yeah, in, in this talk, I'll cover the basics, what the DRA is, because I'm not assuming that everyone is so familiar with it as we are. Um, and I will give you the latest news about where we are, and then John will continue talking about the advanced topics about how we envision topolo topological alignment to be done with DRA going forward. So dynamic resource allocation. As I said, it has been ongoing for a while. You may have heard about it, and it was alpha in previous Kubernetes uh, releases. We finally figured out which part we actually can and want to promote towards beta and GA around the time frame of Kubernetes 131. That's where we did a major overhaul of the entire API. So it was a breaking change in 131, but it set us on a path to where we are now, where that same API is almost unmodified as beta in 132. That is a big milestone. <laughs> Because now we are sure that this API will be around for at least three releases, a bit longer, depending on how long we want to keep it unchanged. It's available. Um, we are doing bug fixes for it. So I highly recommend that if you have been waiting, now is the time to get engaged and ask your vendors about a DRA driver, ask your cloud providers whether they can enable DRA for you, because it's off by default still. It is a, an API group, and there are rules in Kubernetes that say that those need to be off. So. Yeah, I'll interject there that for GKE, uh, we, we will, we do plan to make um, DRA available as an optional that you can enable um, with the with the release of 132 in in the rapid channel. Yeah. So that sets us on a path towards GA. We don't have an exact timeline yet. It now entirely depends on your feedback on whatever we find out. But we are still need to change perhaps in it. Hopefully nothing, but we'll see. Um, so what is it really? Uh, it started out as a, a thought exercise. What's all wrong with a current device plugin interface? What can and what should we do better? So we, we don't plan to replace the device plugin interface. It still remains available. The simple count-based thing that you have been using so far remains in Kubernetes. It's GA. But we think that with DRA, we have a better alternative. And we hope that you will use it and start doing great things that were impossible or not easy so far. Uh, what it does is it provides a much richer API to express complex scenarios, like requesting certain things with attributes, configuring resources. Um, the motivation for it and some of the code actually was borrowed from the persistent volume API. So if you are familiar with that, there, were certain, there will be certain parallels to it. The best way to describe it is probably to look at the main core pieces of it, of this new API. The first part is how devices, how device drivers describe what they have. That's the so-called resource lines, a built-in type. And in the current incarnation, we have a very simplistic device model. We just have a name for it and some attributes. And those attributes are defined by the vendor. It could be something for, in this NVIDIA example, it could be saying that I'm a GPU, I have a certain product ID, I have a certain amount of RAM and certain numbers of compute cores. And then the second part is a resource claim. That's what the users are creating when they are asking for an NVIDIA GPU. They can specify that their workload, their model needs a certain amount of RAM and they are guaranteed to get that. Then the magic behind the scenes that is mostly in the scheduler, that's where 
we are matching the requests in the resource claims against the information provided in the resource slices. And as part of pod scheduling, then set up these objects so that the kubelet, when it sees a pod that needs resource claims, will involve the DRA driver and get the hardware ready for the pod and for container using that hardware. The biggest limitations or the remain reasons why we're doing is that we know that with these advanced AI workloads and big GPUs, we want to subdivide them depending on what the workload needs. We also have use cases around configuring these devices and not just in a way where the admin chooses how to configure them, but really the workload offer. It best example is perhaps an FPGA where you need to pre-program the FPGA to fulfill a certain function. And that's something that the user needs to tell in advance and then some privileged operation takes place before we hand off that prepared hardware device to the user. So that's one example of configuration. Another is uh, user space workload sharing that has different op uh, options available to, to workload offers. Uh, and then the API also allows a different kind of sharing. That's where, because we have a separate object, we can point different pods at the same resource claim. They will share that device. We can decide within a pod which container gets access to it. That's all very explicit and therefore flexible enough to, to, to accommodate different scenarios. Um, we are also preparing this uh, dynamic resource allocation for future extensions. Uh, Dynamic MIG is one example where we know that we need to do a little bit more work. Um, yeah, but we'll, we'll get there. And these pieces will get added in a similar fashion as it was done with volumes where base functionality was beta and GA even, and then additional pieces got added over time. So this is a slide illustrating how that works. Uh, DRA driver consists ours, now in this, in this latest uh, version of DRA entirely of just the Kubelet plugin, so it's easy to develop. The driver is responsible for populating these resource slices. The Kubernetes schedulers, scheduler sees them, and because it knows that it owns those additional resources described in the resource slices, it can do scheduling by directly just picking something for a pod and moving on, doing the next pod immediately. That's a different to an earlier incarnation of DRA that was called classic DRA, but forget about that. It's gone in 132. We no longer need to explain it. Um, the Kubernetes autoscaler, that's the key reason why we made those changes in 131 and focused on this approach is that it can understand the same thing as the scheduler. It can make intelligent decisions about scaling up nodes because it knows which resource license, which devices are on those nodes. Then, the user-facing part, the resource claim, um, we have claims and references to a resource claim in the pod level, and then inside the containers, we reference the claims. The resource claim is, is like a specification of what we want. It has uh, certain attributes that you can select. Selectors are how you express complex requirements in, in a small lang mini language. Um, constraints and match expressions, that is the topic of much of the remaining talks, I'm not going into that. The config is where you can specify user, de uh, driver defined, arbitrary, opaque content. Kubernetes doesn't care what it is, it's just getting passed through. And then the scheduler sets the status, it marks the resource claim is allocated, and then that is the information that is used by Kubert and the DRA driver when it needs to activate that hardware. Great, thank you, Patrick. So one of the, the key things that may be a little bit subtle there that, that you might not pick up in what Patrick just described is that with device plugins, the decision of exactly which devices are chosen is left up to the driver that's running on the node. And in particular, this can become a problem when those when you're asking for multiple devices because those drivers make independent decisions. So um, with DRA, we move that decision-making from the, the node, the plugin in the node, to the scheduler. And that allows us in our claims to provide additional constraints. So like in, the, in, in here, you see this constraints piece Patrick mentioned, and we'll go into this in a little more detail here. But the, the idea is that um, that allows the scheduler to look across drivers at multiple devices and make 
the, uh, the decision. So why would we want to do that? Well, we're going to drill into a specific example of an area where that's, that's important. So this is a simplified node uh, VM topology. Uh, you've got two CPUs. Um, you've got four NIC, four GPUs, rather, and four NICs, um, and each CPU has, is uh, attached to PCIe switches, and you've got the GPU and NIC on one, and um, the, this topology is actually really important in certain pieces of uh, performance. In particular, um, when you're choosing a GPU that's going to utilize a NIC, uh, you really want them to be on the same PCI root complex because that enables you, with NVIDIA in any way, to use GPU direct, which essentially bypasses the, the CPU and, and has dramatically better uh, bandwidth between the GPU and the NIC. So let's walk through what happens when we use device plugin to allocate devices uh, with some requests that come in. Suppose we have this node topology and a first request comes in and it's for just a single GPU. So the, uh, the, the, the scheduler will say, okay, there's, uh, there's a GPU available on that node because the extended resource has been advertised by the device plugin. We're, we're on device plugin here, not DRA. And so it'll fit on that node. And so I will assign the pod to that node. It sends it on to the kubelet. Kubelet sees that there's an extended resource and makes a call to the device plugin. And the device plugin says, oh, all right, there's nothing on here yet. I'm just going to pick GPU zero. Everybody's happy. So GPU zero is now in use. Now we get another request that comes in. This one, though, wants both a GPU and an RDMA NIC. Well, same process happens. The scheduler says, hey, that node has still three GPUs available, and it's got four NICs available, so the, the, the pod will fit. I'll send the pod to that node. The plugin on the node picks it up and says, oh, hey, uh, it's two separate plugins, one for the GPU and one for the RDMA. They each pick the first available option. That's NIC0 and GPU1. But you'll notice that those two are not on the same, uh, they're not on, the, not on the same switch, probably not on the same route either. Um, so the uh, those get used, but now we can't use GPU direct between those two devices because they're sitting on two different PCIe routes. And of course, this process continues where we, uh, the next request comes in, and now we're splitting across, even across the CPU boundary here, and performance is likely even worse. So how does, uh, how, how do we do things with DRA? Um, it's a little more complex on the user API side, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it's a more expressive API. The device plugin says, you know, just that, those counts, you've got extended resources, um, but there's no coordination between the two different devices that have been chosen. Uh, with DRA, this is a resource claim. Um, this particular resource claim is saying, give me an NVIDIA GPU with at least 80 gigs of memory, we don't really care about that in this use case, but I left this slide like this because it just gives you a flavor of um, whereas with the device plugin, we say we want one NIC or one GPU. Here we can actually provide criteria or specificity to which GPU we want, uh, either to make it more precise or less precise. So essentially, this is under-specifying the GPU so that if there's different GPUs that have that much memory available, we could be assigned any one of them. Along with that, we can add a second request for a NIC, um, and in this case, we're saying give us an RDMA VF. Now, if we just sent this to the um, scheduler, just like this, the scheduler would make the same choices that the driver, the two different independent drivers were making, and we'd still have the same problem that we did before. So what we need is one more clause, and that's our constraints. So our constraints clause here says that um, the, the, it lists the request names, and it says all the, the, the constraints listed here apply to these requests, and match attributes, this attribute called PCIe root. So dialing back a little bit to Patrick's discussion, right, the publishing of information about each device is no longer just a count, 
but it's actually detailed information that's specific to that device on that node. So in device plugin, you have some flexibility to choose, say, which GPU you get by using a label selector on the node. But if there's differences between the devices, which of course there are, they have different uh, PCIe routes, for example, um, you have no uh, lever that can get you smaller than node in that selection criteria. But with DRA, because we publish for each device, here's the, the GPU, here's the PCI route it's attached to. We can even do things with NICs, for example, where we would publish what network it's connected to within the larger, broader topology uh, of, of your uh, VPC or whatever. So like the, the, the expressiveness of that API is, is much higher. So in this case, um, we as a community, Kubernetes, we need to come up with some common attributes. Typically, attributes are vendor defined, but we want to define some attributes like PCIe root that can be used across drivers and across vendors so that we can do constraints like this where the, each, the driver publishes for each GPU and for each NIC which PCIe root they're attached to. This constraint then, when the scheduler picks the different GPU, the different devices, it will only choose ones that meet the, the, where the, the set of devices it's chosen meets the constraints that are listed here. So let's walk through that. Um, same setup, but this time we're going to use a DRA request. So we have a device class named GPU NVIDIA. I, I made it a little smaller than the, the last slide, so it'll fit. Um, first request comes in just like before, picks the first G, GPU. Second one comes in, but now because of the match attributes, the scheduler is going to, first it'll try, it'll try NIC0 and GPU1, but then it'll evaluate that that doesn't meet the constraints and it'll discard that solution to the scheduling problem and it'll try the next one. The next one is GPU1, NIC1, that meets all of our constraints. So now we're happy, we can use GPU direct between those, which will effectively, you know, increase the throughput uh, pretty dramatically. And of course, the next request comes in, Exactly the same thing, we, we land on the same PCI route, we pick these two uh, instead of scattering everything all around. So that's pretty cool, um, but in the title we promised you something about TPUs. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with TPUs, but this is Google's um, so solution for uh, uh, AI training and other uh, and inference. Um, and TPUs not exactly the same, because here we're talking about uh, I'm not talking about cross driver, um, but I'm talking about uh, sort of a, a, a way in which we can choose valid topologies within a TPU. So um, here's a similar diagram for TPUs. What we have here, this comes, this is on the Google Cloud uh, documentation. Um, this is showing an eight chip VM. Similarly, you have two CPUs, you have uh, a card with four chips that's uh, sitting on the, uh, uh, close to CPU zero, and you have another card with four chips that's sitting close to CPU one, and you see those big green thick lines uh, that make those kind of uh, rectangular shapes. That's the connectivity between the different chips. So the way we do this in GCE today is if you want to use a one chip topology, our host might look like this, but what your VM looks like is, is this, this kind of a one chip VM here. If you wanted a four chip VM, you know, you might get this, these four chips here. Um, but the thing is that um, there, are, there are only that certain valid topologies. So if you want a, a two-chip, um, uh, a two-chip, uh, you want to allocate two chips for your workload, um, and, and you want to do it at the Kubernetes layer rather than the VM layer. So, so what I'm sort of getting at here is moving this out of the GCE layer and into the Kubernetes layer. Um, you can use these, uh, you can pick chip zero and chip one because it's got one of those green thick lines between it. You can do chip two and chip three. You can do chip zero and chip two, but uh, chip one and chip three, but you can't do chip zero and chip three because there's no direct connectivity. You won't get the performance that you expect. And so it's not a topology that we support when you're allocating um, uh, TPU chips uh, as, a, as a set. So, we can use match attributes just like we do for cross-driver things within the driver um, 
and that can solve part of our problem. So here's an example of a way we could advertise those four GPU chips, zero through three, and allow match attribute constraints to be used to select some of those. But I actually have a problem here. And the problem is that um, the user can't just ask for two TPUs and use a match attribute expression to, uh, to satisfy and get any of the possible two-chip topologies. And we actually have a similar problem. Kevin's sitting here. He's our, our third co-chair. He's from NVIDIA, and, and, and they have a similar problem uh, with MIG, right? You can't, you, you, there's certain ways they get advertised, and, and you can't select them just with, with this sort of operation. So um, what that means is that, you know, in this case, I could ask for a two-by-one, in which case I could, I could say uh, the two-by-one attribute should match. I would get, say, either both west or both east ones. But if only the north ones were available, I wouldn't be able to schedule. So um, um, so I guess I, I kind of covered this slide a little bit. Um, there's a, how, how do we solve that problem? Um, there's another option we're considering um, beyond matching attri attributes, which is a equality match, um, we can actually implement a cell expression that does the match. So this has been proposed as an alpha feature, and we're looking at it. Uh, the AWS folks are interested in building it because for their neuron chips, they need sequential. In TPU, we have square. They need, they need sort of sequential things paired together. And the match attributes can't quite cover that either for them. But I'll be honest with you, like all of this looks pretty hard on the user. If you, if you watch the, the recent keynote, um, one of the, the presenters said, um, you know, a lot of technology is about where you put the complexity. I mean, a lot of the decisions we make is do we, who, who makes the, who has, to, who has to digest all the complexity? And I'd actually really like to find a way to hide the complexity, at least of these TPU and, and MIG and, and, and things uh, uh, from the user, so you don't have to deal with that. It's a little harder to hide it from the user when you're talking about um, independent vendors with different devices because the user is the only one that necessarily knows about those. But when we're talking about one vendor, one driver, yes, there is a way to hide the complexity. So um, this is another proposal that we have, uh, another alpha proposal. And uh, Patrick said, right, we're going 132 to beta with DRA, but we're going to make a lot of a lot of improvements over time. So we have a bunch of alpha, alpha features on, on the plate. This is one that we're, uh, we're hoping to get into 133. We'll see. But effectively, it moves all of this complexity I just talked about with the TPUs and the, the partitioning and how which ones are valid top topologies. And it pushes it onto the device model and onto the vendor to build their driver. And from a user point of view now, you can just say, I want a, I want a two-chip TPU, or I want a four-chip TPU, or I want a NVIDIA MIG partition you know, of this profile. And all of the magic would happen behind the scenes. The user doesn't have to understand alignment or anything like that. And in fact, we can even push it to that cross-vendor thing, but that's another, maybe another topic for another talk. But we do believe it's, it's possible to build on top of that a driver that looks across other drivers and allocates a NIC and a GPU as a unit. So, um, lots there, I know, uh, but I'll say the takeaway here is um, in 132, DRA is going beta. It gives you a lot of flexibility. There's some really powerful things in there. Um, it's still complex. In 133, 134, and beyond, we're really focusing on how do we make it simpler for the end user, even if that puts more complexity on the vendor. Um, so that's it. We have time for questions. Um, before we go there, though, I did want to mention that we have all these other talks. Most of these are in the past. But right after this, or shortly after this, there will be a, uh, a demo uh, in the Google booth. And there will be an additional talk where Kevin will talk about some other interesting ways you can use the DRA, DRA API in multi-host situations. Uh, and you'll, you will also be available for questions there. So uh, uh, if you're interested, please join us 
Um, and we have about 10 minutes for questions now. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> is there any appetite within the DRA project? Can you scoot like, a little closer to the no, microphone? Um, it's a scoping question. Is there any appetite within the DRA project to do like driver selection um, in a resource claim? So say you want to take an NVIDIA uh, GPU, um, use the NVIDIA driver to match and to make sure you're selecting the right GPU, and then switch it over to the VFIO driver for pass-through um, would be a kind of an instance there. Kevin, Kevin gave us a thumbs up. I it's the second talk. So, uh, in general speaking, uh, without going into NVIDIA specifics, there is a way how a driver, if it's statically provisioned on the node, could advertise its version. So, our attributes support something like a semantic version where you can say, I need semantic version one dot something. And you will be sure that that API is available, supported by the device when you land on a node. That would be static. The other thing would be that you could have a, a driver that supports configuration parameters to select a version, and then it gets reconfigured dynamically before the device is handed to a workload. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, what about soft constraints? What about soft constraints, right? So if you think, let, let's say in the TPU, you could have the diagonal. Still, right. I, I'm sorry, I'm still having trouble with you understanding. Okay, what about soft constraints? What if I could do ah. the diagonal, but it would be, you know, less preferable? <sighs> and, and what about, uh, expo <laughs> you know, is there a mechanism for the, the, the running parts then to know which constraints have been satisfied and which have been not satisfied? That's so, a, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, we have one other proposal pending that John is actually driving where we specify first off. It's basically a list of alternative solutions for your request that would be valid, that would be acceptable for your workload. And uh, it will then lead to an allocation where one of those potential alternatives is chosen. We envision it at the moment so that it is picking the first one that's available, but not necessarily scoring or anything. So it might end up with a situation where it picks one node where the second alternative is available, although there is another node where the first one would have been satisfied. And both seem equally valuable. But it's basically random which gets picked. So we may also need to do something with scoring which we also don't do at the moment, where you specify, okay, I'm, I'm fine with these different alternatives, but please pick for one that gives me a better, better experience, better performance, if you can. That would allow gracefully degrading, basically, depending on what's currently available. Uh, informing the workload about what it got, that is part of the DRA driver. They need, at, at least right now, it is the job of the driver. Uh, we have had discussions about some downward API extensions where it would become possible for the workload author to say, okay, I'm peeking into resource claims and what they, attributes they have, and I decide what environment where we will get set and to which value. That would be probably more flexible because you don't depend on what the DRA driver supports. You could do something yourself saying, okay, I, I see that my request one of these alternatives got the second one. And then based on that said something, we haven't specified how that would look like. It, it is one of those things that definitely has come up, but needs, needs a design, needs... Yeah, yeah needs a design and scoring in particular, as, as we've discussed in the past, is, is something that I've been thinking a lot about, and because it's it's really necessary for the, the this prioritized list um, that Patrick just described to be as valuable as we'd like, and also, um, you know, but there's a lot of complexity there, but absolutely something we're interested in. Uh, next here, uh, this is a, probably a beginner question. So, when we describe the device, someone has to return the values of how this. Uh, what is the capa capability of this device? It's sort of like a <clears throat> driver thing. So, for example, I believe NVIDIA driver, <clears throat> the NVIDIA GPU will be supported, but 
where do those support coming from? Do we need to install other like actual, actual drivers to get, for example, AMD GPU supported, or it comes from the this DRI feature by default? So the drivers, at any given node, um, we don't support running both a device plugin and a device and a DRA driver for the same devices. So um, yes, there is a separate driver for like for NVIDIA, there's a separate DRA driver um, that publishes things to the resource slice API rather than to the extended resource API. And um, that will need to be run in your cluster in place of the existing device plugin. Um, eventually, uh, we have ideas about how to have a single driver that can handle whether the, regardless of which API the user uses, whether they use the extended resource API to request the resource, or they use the newer DRA APIs to request the resource, the same driver can satisfy it. Um, I think maybe we'll get there when we get to GA. Maybe that needs to be a GA criteria, but uh, for beta, we don't we don't have that right now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Patrick, can you comment or provide some information about the scheduling, optimization, advanced scheduler, for example, advanced beam packing for the resource devices or partition devices, right? A naive one could uh, cause some resource fragmentation problem, create holes. So, yeah, I'm wondering any ongoing work or plan for that. Thank you. So. At the moment, the algorithm is fairly simplistic. It really literally just walks through the different alternatives that satisfy what we described in the API, um, and then picks the first solution that it finds. It does not try to optimize in any way. So I, I'm, I'm with you. It probably can lead to fragmentation on nodes. Um, Scoring might help, but then we need to figure out what, how do we actually identify fragmentation and how do we avoid it based on attributes that at the moment to the scheduler are completely opaque. That, that is a challenging problem. We are moving the logic into the scheduler, but the scheduler ultimately doesn't really know anything. It just sees attributes and doing heuristics, which probably might be needed here, that may depend on additional hints that uh, a driver offer may have to provide, and we don't know yet what that looks like. Yeah, it, yeah. I'll, I'll just say, like, this gets back to scoring because it, it is related, but it's not the same thing, right? So, um, the whatever we do for scoring, it's not going to be single dimensional. They'll have to be, like, like for example. Um, bin packing, when you have a MIG and you could take, uh, there's one empty slot and it would fit exactly in there, and then you've got that GPU fully consumed, that seems like a good idea, right? Um, alternatively, you could stick it on a fresh, open, empty GPU and use up a whole, not, that's now no longer can be used for the whole GPU. Which of those is the better answer? Might actually be a preference of the user or the cluster administrator or some combination thereof. So whatever we do for scoring, we need to provide like measures like wastefulness. How much, how much of a GPU are we aware of, of a device are we wasting with this choice? Or um, bin, you know, uh, uh, some sort of, um, uh, there might be some performance penalties or weights, like depending on if you, uh, what choice you make. And some of that is gonna come from the vendor, some of that's gonna come from the cluster admin, and some preferences about that are gonna come from the user. So it's a super complicated problem, but, um, you know, I'd love you know you to join us as uh, and, and and help us solve it. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm from Nvidia. Also, I have been uh, active contributor to SIG scheduling. I understand the challenge. Yeah, I just said uh, with the increasing adoption of DIA and uh, with the 132 release, and uh, that's probably will becoming a more important problem. And somehow, yeah, I think the community can work together and uh, come up with some improved solution and avoid. Okay, thank you. Thank FD you, would yeah. happy to contribute. Thank you. Yeah, we have, I think, time for one super quick question, if there's any more. Uh, otherwise, oh yeah, uh, you, uh, we'll repeat it. Or, so I, I can't remember if it was the first or the second question, but the, the notion of having sort of secondary scheduling, so fallback scheduling if the optimal topology isn't available, say, well, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice 
optimal performance t just to get scheduled at all. That introduces problems uh, like multi-tenancy problems. It pollutes the whole matrix optimization of all the other GPUs as you're sort of going through in that slide. Like once you have that diagonal thing, then nothing after that is able to be optimized as a, as a whole. Well, possibly. I mean, I think that, that um, the, the, the envisioned use case for that is more like I'd prefer, you know, an H100, but if it's not available, I'll take an A100, but if that's not available, I'll take two L4s, right? Like that's kind of the level of request we're sort of doing as opposed to, well, I want an aligned, I mean, you could do it though, right? I want an aligned on the on the PCIe route, but I'll take it without it if I if I can't get it. But um, yeah, I mean, this is the, fra that's exactly the fragmentation problem. And um, it, 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 we'll have to figure out Right. So the comment was that it actually reduces capacity because it, it, it actually, dis, dis, it's not just fragmentation, it disrupts the ability to satisfy claims in the future. Yeah. Um, perhaps the whole flexibility that we have with the array is not something that we actually should use and make available to the user. Like the scheduling thing of a, a, a grid of cores it might just be a very valuable restriction to say you need to request things that are powers of two. Even though workloads only needs three, it doesn't make sense to specify such a workload because it eventually increases fragmentation. So it might just make more sense to say, align your resources so that we can still do scheduling fairly well along uh, these dimensions. So we'll have, we'll have a lot of things to play with, but we're actually over time now. So thank you all and uh, check out these other talks as well. Thank you.